This has not been the year to be in the exchange business. Just as we've seen anti-money laundering laws, know your customer, KYC rules, there are actually a whole raft of additional regulations that are about to come into play. The crypto community has received FinCEN's guidance and public statements on virtual currencies as reassuring forms of legitimization, collectively as a stamp of approval of sorts, and is certainly relieved that things have... The things have so far not gotten worse. However, as Bitcoiners are learning, being labeled a money transmitter is a rather heavy load to carry. It has already undermined one of Bitcoin's primary features, anonymity, and it may soon get worse. The same may because the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, CFPB, has not yet publicly confirmed whether and to what extent implementation of Regulation E by money transmitters, known as the Remittance Transfer Rule, will be applicable to virtual currency providers as well. However, as long as the U.S. government continues to equate convertible virtual currency operators to money transmitters, I suspect it will. Jumping ahead, as of October 28, 2013, all money transmitters will have to comply with remittance transfer rules and implement measures that largely overlap with the ones currently in force at a state level. There are a number of these obligations, but the primary one that concerns us here is condition F, providing for 30 minutes and sometimes more for a consumer to cancel a transfer, during which time the consumer can get their money back if they cancel. This is something that only will apply to legitimate Bitcoin exchanges. The OTC market won't have to do this. Local Bitcoins won't have to do this. So again, it's another layer of, of burden being applied to these exchanges. And the concern here is that in order to implement this, it means that you either can trade with a minimum lag time of 30 minutes, which of course seems like it'll encourage gaming of the exchange system, because if you can place an order now, but then have 30 minutes to cancel it, then you basically get to watch for the next 29 minutes, see if the trade goes your way. If it does, you go with it. If it doesn't, you just cancel it and it's no loss to you. So you, you, have, a, you have a situation you can win, but one you can't really lose. Do you guys think that this is something that can be implemented on the exchanges? Is this like another nail in the coffin or does this not matter? Oh, I'm pretty sure they'll try to bend over backwards to comply with this um, because they're scared, you know, of the regulators. Not that I blame them for that, but I'm sure the legacy banking system absolutely loves this because this can take away some of the competitive edge of Bitcoin. And this is one of the pressure points that exists in the Bitcoin, I guess, ecosystem that regulatory pressure can be applied to, which is the exchanges. I mean, I don't really have a great solution to it except maybe moving away from the centralized exchanges, or perhaps there'll be massive non-compliance and it just won't be able to be enforced. I'm not exactly sure. Or this only applies to U.S. exchanges because, well, it does. Oh, so then there'll be no U.S. exchanges. <laughs> so there'll be no uh, U.S. exchanges. I mean, this is, this is really, to me, indicative of the complete lack of understanding of this medium and also the attempt to apply kind of knee-jerk categorizations. This is just like being in 1990 and talking to telecom regulators about the internet and they're saying, look, we're not trying to be unreasonable people here. All we're asking is that your newfangled internet network has some of the basic capabilities required by law. It must offer a dial tone. All other telecommunication networks do. It must offer <laughs> ISDN and fax. All other. I don't see what the problem is here. Just offer a dial tone. So you don't understand this is not a phone network. Well, we're going to have to play the same game and, and say, you don't understand this is not a traditional payment network. If we did have to implement escrow services on the front end of exchanges, I think that would be a, a serious risk to network neutrality. And it would add one more nail in the coffin of US-based exchanges and push more people to local Bitcoin. So now, are we talking about US-based exchanges? Because I was under the impression that the way the financial rules work in our world is that Pelly Brangard mentioned this when we spoke last week, that if you have a single US customer then as far as FinCEN is concerned, you fall under their guidelines and you need to comply with all of the rules for, for, for essentially the country. So is this just U.S. exchanges or is this any exchange that wants to ever, like Mt. Gox, for example, I think that this applies to them given that they have so many U.S. customers, right? If they want to continue having U.S. customers and they're not willing to fight the U.S. regulators, yes, absolutely it does. This is really kind of trickle down pressure, right? Because the, the issue isn't that the regulators can put pressure on Mt. Gox. The issue here is that the American regulators can put pressure on the Japanese regulators who can put pressure on the Japanese banks, 
who do not get to deal with American banks unless they follow these rules. And then those banks can put pressure on Mt. Gox. So essentially, the tentacles of the US government and financial regulatory system spread far and wide in the world. And as long as other countries are willing to give up their sovereignty in that way, they are going to be subject to these regulations. Universal jurisdiction, it's not a good thing. So right now, the Bitcoin Foundation is sort of walking back their ambitions to try and get involved the Washington lobbying scene in, in a substantial way, as, as it kind of seemed we were moving before. It seems like this is exactly the scenario where you need something like that. Maybe it's not the Bitcoin Foundation doing it, but the need to explain this stuff to say, I'm sorry, the internet is just not a phone network, so you can't get a dial tone from it, you know, in much the same way that, that you would say here. I'm sorry, you know, Bitcoin payments are all about being irreversible and about being somewhat, you know, pretty close to instant. So by doing this, you eliminate a lot of the advantages that the users have. I mean, is that a case that can even be made at this point? Or is it just, okay, well, if it doesn't fit into those boxes, then there's no box it fits into. This is going to be a fight. It's, it's not going to be an easy conversation. There are interests on both sides of this argument. And so this is going to be a protracted legal battle where precedents will be set through lawsuits. Eventually, it will settle down. I mean, you know, it's, it's been 15 years on the internet. We're still operating under the 1996 Telecommunications Act. We're still operating under the obsolete CALEA law enforcement access laws. We're still operating under all kinds of regulations that are completely out of date for the internet. And the end result, of course, is that what that does is it erodes the rights, uh, privileges, and immunities of the people who use the internet because of these antiquated laws. We're going to have the exact same fight on our hands with Bitcoin. And, you know, it's going to be an ongoing negotiation. If the U.S. ends up tying up all of the exchanges in, in so much regulation that they can't operate, uh, then people will have to operate outside the U.S. and people will have to start skirting or flaunting the rules of U.S. banking institutions. Simple as that. So you don't see any scenario where compliance with the existing rules actually is, is feasible in a way that doesn't significantly harm the, the function of these institutions? I think that as soon as you reach that goalpost, they're going to move the goalpost, Adam. These rules, there is no end to these rules. There is no end to these regulations. And as we heard from interviews of the uh, head of the National Association of Money Transmitters, for example, these rules essentially keep changing and they always change in benefits of the incumbent. And they always put more and more barriers in the way of uh, new entrants. You know, the incumbents are used to playing the regulatory game and they're willing to spend tens of millions of dollars doing fake compliance all day, all year, because that means that that $10 million that they spend on fake compliance is anti-competitive money against others who can't spend it. So it's a cozy situation for them. It's not as if it's costing them their ability to commit fraud. So we always get back to this question of, is it malice? Do they just not understand? And is there not an easy way for them to adapt their understanding to the new reality? There is no possible way for people to absorb the rapid and disruptive change that Bitcoin brings. It upends so many assumptions, institutions, and applied processes for money that it will cause disruption, and that's inevitable. So, yeah, I, I don't expect people to suddenly say, you know, have an aha moment and say, okay, oh, wait, no, I understand. Bitcoin is completely new. It's completely different. Let's rewrite the rules. <laughs> yeah, it's going to take a while, but there's no malice here. I mean, this is, this is just institutional and inertia. So much in our world today is really just institutional inertia. It's people reading the rules within a specific frame and context and then trying to apply them the best they can and ending up with completely bizarre situations. The various problems that exchanges have been having has really had an impact on local Bitcoins. I've had a profile up there for a while, and again, there's not a lot of activity in my local area. But in the past couple of days, I've had probably three or four people contact me after a month of basically nothing before that. So, Stephanie, I know you've had some kind of similar experiences. You know, I mean, it seems like that's a direction that this could go in. If, if, the, if the game plan here for the formal compliant exchanges is to essentially make them less and less functional by increasing the regulatory burden on them, then what do you think? think that does to a market like local bitcoins it's going to be booming i mean <laughs> that's the only thing that can happen and then you know i'm sure there'll be some attempt to crack down on local bitcoins too after that but it's going to be like 
like whack-a-mole. I mean, and you really can't stop if you, if you as the government, they really can't stop people from trading person to person, face to face, going on Bitcoin OTC or site like local Bitcoins. Decentralized is the way to go. It's kind of inevitable process. Uh, regulations are going to be ratcheted up on the exchanges. They're going to be applied bit by bit and the exchanges are going to do their best to comply with them. They're probably not going to say no, probably not going to say, well, we can't. I mean, they may try to move, you know, they may try to go to jurisdictions which are friendlier, but then U.S. based users will still have the problem that they'll want to get Bitcoins and maybe they can't get an account on an exchange that's outside of the U.S. or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, all it's going to do is just increase local Bitcoins, increase interest in people wanting to work for Bitcoins so that they don't have to deal with buying them, increase interest in mining so that people don't have to deal with buying them. Where there's a will, there's a way. If people want to get Bitcoins, they're going to get them. They're just going to have to get a little bit more creative. I think we'll also see what this will do is it also creates market opportunities for those incumbents that do have the money to to play the regulatory game with the regulators to come at this from a completely different angle. And I'm thinking something like the Winklevoss Twins uh, Bitcoin ETF or a mainstream bank, perhaps one of our local banks here, Silicon Valley Bank, fulfilling some of its initial movements it did with CoinLab and coming into this market as a properly regulated FDIC insured exchange. You know, SIPC, FDIC, SEC, check all the boxes and come in and play this game. It will create some opportunities for those incumbents who can play the game to come in and they'll have a better chance of working with the regulators because they know all the tricks of working with the regulators. I'm not worried. This thing is big enough now that there are multiple angles from which these regulations and and any friction and resistance is going to be eroded. So Stephanie, you just described a situation that is completely decentralized, basically, and that relies on person to person transactions, which you can't basically stop. And Andreas, you then went on to, to describe a situation where because of the regulatory burden increasingly moving forward, you have a situation where there are fewer and fewer actually compliant exchanges that get bigger and bigger because they have so much less competition. So it, it seems like on both sides of this issue, we have really diverted, you know, and we're, we're, co- we're totally going to the extremes either way, no matter how this works out. Look, there's incentives. As, as Stephanie said, where there's a will, there is a way. And there's incentives for people to buy Bitcoin because it's useful. So they will. Yeah. And it's probably going to separate people. I mean, there, there may be a little bit of a, a sort of a class divide, I guess you could say, because if you have enough money to want to be investing in Bitcoins in an ETF, well, you're going to go with the Winklevosses, right? But if you want to buy Bitcoins with, you know, 10% of your weekly paycheck, then you probably go to local Bitcoins or something like that. Yeah, I mean, it it is interesting. There could be this big divergence. You're listening to Let's Talk Bitcoin, the premier audio cast providing news and insights that cover the rapidly evolving world of digital money. Our twice weekly shows include analysis of late breaking news, updates on key technical, business and regulatory issues, and in-depth interviews with the key people driving the new digital economy. Let's Talk Bitcoin offers sponsors an attractive way to reach a targeted and savvy audience. For more information, email sponsors at letstalkbitcoin.com.